say yes to opportunities. So something's presented to you and you feel uncomfortable about it and you feel it's totally out of your comfort zone, then you absolutely should give it a go because if I didn't say yes to an opportunity that came to me five or six years ago and I didn't stretch out of my comfort zone, then I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you and have this amazing award behind me. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for Real Estate Industry Sales Professionals, Property Managers and Leaders. With thanks to our partner Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking and strategies to elevate your results. To download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts, visit EliteAgentElevate.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, Visit connectnow.com.au. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of this week's show. On today's podcast, I'm pleased to welcome the winner of the 2020 Area for Most Influential Woman in the Property Market, Laura Valenti. Laura's been in PM for almost two decades and is the Director of Solutions Property Management in Queensland. She's also a board director with the REIQ and a passionate advocate for the industry. Laura's recent focus has involved addressing domestic violence, including examining the role property managers can play in handling the issue. So Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sam. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here and I'd like to start once again with another congratulations on your recent area award, which was well and truly deserved among some stiff competition. How did you find out that you'd won? By email. It's a little bit different this year, isn't it, with awards? You don't get to go to the flashy award ceremonies and wear your nice frocks. So I was working from home and I knew that it would come by email. So I kept checking. (laughs) Hit the refresh button. (laughs) And then it came and it said, congratulations. And I got a nice call from my account manager from realestate.com. So yeah, it was good. It was different, but nice. (laughs) Yeah. Amazing. It's a big award, most influential female in the property market. So what does winning that sort of award mean to you? Oh gosh, on a number of levels, I guess it, it is important. Well, firstly, it means that perhaps what you're doing is going on the right track, that what I'm trying to do, not just with physically what I'm doing in my business, but other things in the community, things that I'm doing, that perhaps uh, I am going along the right track, which is great. It's great to be recognised by peer in the industry. And of course, being a national award, this really has a lot of significance for me. Um, It's not just a state award, but it is a national award open to pretty much every agent in Australia. So I just feel so very honoured and grateful. But on a more ethereal level, I guess, I also think that this is a great win for property managers because most of them are women. And I like to think that I perhaps represent female property managers and hopefully we can move towards being recognised for all the fabulous work that they all do. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great achievement for property management throughout Australia. It's amazing. A major reason I think that you received the most influential award was due to the work, as I mentioned in the intro, that you've been doing in the domestic violence space. And I'd love to take a deep dive into that shortly. But in the meantime, let's learn a little bit more about you. I mean, we met years and years ago. How did you come to be in property management to begin with? I think like most people, we kind of fall into it, don't we? I was actually working in um, tourism. I was actually a flight attendant and I had absolutely no ambitions to go into real estate. And my husband decided he had his license. He decided to buy a real estate office. And I said, oh, yeah, well, when I'm in town, I'll just help out a little bit. And so it kind of took control of me, I guess, and and more so the property management side. So he was taking care of sales and I was learning. I learned like from there, I learned, I went to courses and I, and I got my license and I just learned how property management worked. And I really found that it suited me, my kind of detail oriented mind and my affinity towards structure and processes. And so i tended to be good at it, I guess. And so the more I delved into it, the more I learned, the more I loved it. What office we had was a franchise office. So we decided then in 2008 to get rid of the sales 
part of it because we just wanted to concentrate on property management. And so we then opened up our office solutions property management in Burpengary with about 70 properties and two staff. And uh, we started from there. And so what does the business look like now? How's it grown over that period of time? Sure. We now operate, we have a, a head office in North Lakes and we have about, I think, 15 staff here. And then we have a subsidiary office in Springfield. So the North Lakes office takes care of basically the Moreton Bay region north of Brisbane, this whole area here. And then the Springfield office, we cover basically the south of Brisbane, Springfield and Logan and right down to not the Gold Coast, but maybe to about Coomera, Pimpama. So big areas and we employ three staff down there. So in total, we manage over a thousand properties between the two offices. Yeah, amazing. Congratulations on that. It's, it sounds like an amazing business that you've built as well over a period of time. Thank you. A lot of hard work, let me tell you, especially yeah. the first five years. I don't remember sleeping, actually. <laughs> Property management is not the easy career choice, so you have to love it, as you said. So one of the more recent areas that you've been focused on is how the property management industry can better handle the issue of domestic violence. So we've seen around Australia, a lot of the domestic violence laws have changed. Can you tell us how that became a priority for you? I guess I've always been interested in how we can maybe help tenants who reach out and perhaps need to break their lease early or leave due to domestic and family violence. And we've always, even before it became a hot topic in the past couple of years, we've always sought to represent the tenant in going to the owner and asking if they can perhaps leave early and the reasons behind it. And as you probably know, before this COVID emergency response laws came out, the tenant had to actually go to QCAT to the tribunal to um, end their lease if the owner wasn't willing to accommodate them. And gosh, I just can't imagine if you've been through that trauma of um, domestic family violence to then go through another trauma of trying to break your lease and go to QCAT and represent yourself. So we've always, and I think most property managers are the same, we've always been, I think, more towards the tenant in trying to, let's get them out of the lease. Look, it's not going to help the owner to continue this lease, that they might just leave anyway and stop paying their rent. What's the point of holding a tenant to a lease when they're not paying their rent? So we've always tried to convince owners of that, and some owners are really sympathetic, but others maybe not so much. So when this COVID emergency response tenancy laws came out, don't get me wrong, there were quite a few of them that we objected to, but the one on domestic family violence totally supported and, and totally behind it because it meant that a tenant could legally, as long as they had, of, of course, you need um, proof, not anyone can do it, but if there was proof of domestic family violence, then they can just now, get, in Queensland, give one week's notice and leave the tenancy, whether it's a sole tenancy or the perpetrator is still living there as a co-tenant. So I think we all breathed a collective sigh of relief, to be honest, as property managers, because it means that we didn't have to convince owners to do the right thing. Now it was, well, it's law, let's move on. So I was a big supporter of that. And also uh, last year, I was honoured to have been invited by the local council as a business leader to a roundtable conference on domestic family violence. The government here is really big on awareness. And so I heard from these past victims and how their lives were changed by people assisting them to get out of that relationship and I came back thinking, wow, I, I don't know very much about this subject. Fortunately, I've never experienced it in my life. I don't have anyone close to me who's experienced it. But I felt as property managers, we are privy to what happens behind closed doors merely by the fact that we go and do our routine inspections. So let's look into it about how perhaps we can just do our little bit to assist. And so 
we got a lot of tools at that meeting and I brought it to our office and we had a special meeting and spoke about what I'd learned and all the resources that are available to women in this situation is just incredible. There are so many groups, government funded and private and just so many people out there willing to help. It's just unbelievable. The problem is to put the victims or the survivors in touch with these groups and also, of course, awareness by us as bystanders who can notice, acknowledge, who can maybe see the signs of domestic family violence and maybe just start to have a conversation with the victims and let them know that there is help out there for them. Yeah, it's such a tricky one though, isn't it? Because a lot of women that are victims to that sort of thing, they don't like to talk about it. So I, I guess it's, it's really important to let them know in some way that support's out there. How did your team respond to that when you brought the tools and things in? It was so interesting. They lapped it up. Sometimes I can go a bit overkill with my training. So, you know, oh, another training session. But they just really responded really, really well to it. We're not asking property managers to be counsellors because that's not what it's all about. It's just about being community-minded and looking out for your fellow female. I think they took it on board really well. And actually, I found from that out of a group of, I think there were... 15, 16 women, two had experienced domestic family violence in some way in the past. And actually one realised that she had just broken up with her partner. He was being emotionally violent towards her. From talking about it, she realised that and she just had a real epiphany. So it's around and it's more prevalent than than we think. So what you're saying is it's not just physical violence, it can be emotionally, mentally very draining for someone too. Yeah, they play games with their minds and they make them feel like they're worth nothing and so who's going to have you? And it's just that constant mental abuse that I believe can be even worse than physical because there's no signs of it happening. There's no... There's no outward, yeah. The bruises can still run deep mentally. At this stage, like putting your REIQ hat on, you've created a toolkit for the REIQ to use. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So I actually can't take credit for that. We've been using the toolkit that was created a couple of, it was a couple of years ago now. And so I've been promoting it quite heavily. It's a resource that has a lot of, firstly, how to see the signs of domestic violence. And if you see the signs of what to do, And it was something actually that Antonia Mercarella, our CEO, had a lot to do with. She's really championed this cause as well. And all the groups that are available, who to be in touch, who to call, online services, et cetera. And it also allows you to know what to do. So if you suspect that there is DFV happening, then what to do, how to approach the victim. Do you call someone or do you just approach the victim, which is what they say you actually do approach the victim and not call someone in without their knowledge because that can have a a really bad, bad result. And so it contains all of that. But recently now with the new laws, then there's even more information and things that have changed in the tenancy space. And so along with Q Shelter, the REIQ has done up some really great little videos that um, explain what property managers can do to assist where possible. So these resources are are really great that the REIQ has produced. Yeah, it's such important work and, and thank you for championing the cause on behalf of those women. Is there anywhere that you'd like to see the framework heading in the future? I've been thinking about this and At the moment, the REIQ has fabulous resources. However, it is only open to REIQ members. So number one, if you're in Queensland, join the REIQ. And if you are in the REIQ, please go to your members section and and have a look at those videos and look at those resources because it really is eye-opening how much DFV is around that you just may not even know. And then I think fundamentally this is a community issue. And in order for everyone to perhaps have that awareness, why can't this be part of our initial registration course? So in property management and sales, we do our official course so that we can get our registration from the Office of Fair Trading. And there's five or six subjects. It's not very hard. You can do it online. Why can't one of those subjects be 
how to uh, recognise and deal with possible domestic family violence in tenants. And uh, what a great thing that would be for our industry if everyone who then starts in real estate has this at the forefront of their minds. Wow, I know how to recognise and I know what to do if I see it. So that's one thing that could be done, have it introduced as a small subject out of the five or six that, that we have to do. Yeah, amazing. I think a lot of people are calling for that these days because I think to be a property manager or even a good real estate agent, you need to um, be really good at human psychology, number one, because you see people, as you say, at some of the worst points in their lives, whether it happens to be someone's passed away or a divorce or something like that, and a bit of emotional intelligence can go a long, long way. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be long. It could even just be an hour session, just having the resources and just being informed about how to look for the signs and where to go, what to do. That's it. It doesn't take a lot of time to inform someone. Yeah, absolutely. So you're passionate also about empowering women in your workplace, which we just talked briefly about. And I think from memory, the latest ABS census data indicates that about 60% of real estate workers are female. Why is empowering women important to you? And what sort of strategies do you personally put in place in your business? So I will add to that statistic that you talk about real estate, but if you want to hone in on property management, I believe 82% are women in property management. So why is it important to empower women? I think if I go back, I went to an all-girls school, so we didn't have the boys to compare with us. And we were all treated like the individuals that we were and we were encouraged to do our very best. And then I didn't think about the male-female thing. And when I left school, went to uni, and then, of course, you had the experience of competing with or, or working with men. And I just felt like there was just, there was always something that, did hold women back. I really didn't pay much attention to it because you get focused and you just do what you need to do. But uh, if I look back at various times in my career, there was one particular, I had a job in the tourism industry and I was ready for a promotion and I was the best person for that promotion in-house, but it was given to a man And I was told the reasons were because he was a man and they felt that he would deal better with the Asian clients that they had. And I said, well, you know, that's unfair. That's just not. And that was the first time that I felt that glass ceiling and I didn't like it. And I was in my early 20s. So anyway, fast forward to to now and I see that the biggest problem, I think, is actually us ourselves, the women who, who don't perhaps have the self-confidence that they need to actually push forward and realise the goals that they have. And I find that a lot of my training and coaching uh, with the women, particularly in my team, are just to get them to build their self-confidence and their self-esteem. A lot of women, and especially property management, because it's not a look at me, look at me kind of uh, profession like sales can tend to be. And so a lot of people who are attracted to property management really are behind the scenes people. They're they're happy to sit behind the scenes. They're happy to do their work, make sure it's done properly and go home. And so it can be hard for them to acknowledge what job they're doing and to give themselves confidence that they are doing a great job and perhaps they could be doing better. They could be getting a promotion if only they put themselves up for it, if they back themselves. And so uh, a lot of my coaching is building, I guess, confidence in the team and letting them know how valuable they are and that they can really achieve what they set their minds to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny, even with Elite Agent, we get a lot of people putting themselves forward that are salespeople for Consider Me for a Story, but we've got to go knocking on the doors of the property managers to be able to feed to them. It's very different. It is, yeah. And I guess the industries are very different, even though we're under the same umbrella. They're two very different job descriptions. And you're right, property managers don't tend to seek the limelight. But it's not about that. It's about knowing that you're doing a great job and perhaps being a role model for others, you know, who could progress in their career if only they had that uh, confidence in themselves. Yeah. You mentioned before that we all know that there is a high turnover in property manager and high rates of burnout too, because I think traditionally property managers get not quite as much support in the office as 
as sales. And I hate myself for saying that because we were saying that 10 years ago and, and in some cases it's changed, but in other cases it's still the same. How do you keep your team fresh and help them balance the demands of being in property management with having a life and keep them from burning out? Really great question. How long do you have? Um, <laughs> I Well, firstly, I I wouldn't ask the team to do what I wouldn't be prepared to do. And I know that a lot of property managers are tasked with working for long hours simply because of the nature of not being able to get hold of people during the day. And they're given a phone and they're told that you need to answer that phone no matter what. And so they're taking calls after hours or they're answering emails after hours. And I think that's a big mistake. I used to do it because that I'm a workaholic and it was my business. Like it's different because it was my business. But I soon found that the, the owners, my clients were expecting me to be on call for them and it just wasn't working and I was getting very stressed out. So I decided that was it. I wouldn't answer my phone unless I knew who was calling. They can leave a message. I, I wouldn't email a client in the after hours because I didn't want them to think that I was working after hours. And you know what? They accept it. Banks work bank hours. Why can't we? Unless it's an emergency. And how often do emergencies happen really? And what can I do about the rain that's coming into a hole in the roof while it's raining? Not even a trader can go out and do anything while it's raining. So we need to be realistic about our limitations and, and what we're expected to do. So now with my staff, they have their phone, but I tell them, look, if it rings after hours, don't feel obligated to answer it unless you're actually waiting for someone to, to call you and, and switch off at night time. And even when we had the lockdown and we were all working from home last year, I said to the girls, now we've got to do this right. In the morning, you get dressed, you put on your your uniform shirt, doesn't matter what you wear down there, but put on your uniform shirt. We're going to do a Zoom in the morning and then work. And then at five o'clock or 5.30, whenever you finish, take off, you know, get changed and that's it. Now you're home and that would not blur the lines between home and work. And I think that worked quite well. So to stop that burnout, recognise when your day is over and try to switch off. You're right. Now it has changed a little bit. I think there's a lot more specialised property management businesses who don't focus so much on sales. And I think that's a really positive thing. I still think that there are a lot of sales property management offices that maybe don't have that balance right. And I think that uh, an important thing is to have structure in the business, know who's doing what job. This person's doing leasing, that person's managing those properties. You've got to have structure, policy and processes. I cannot emphasise this enough. The day that I wrote my policy and procedure manual was like I was free because I didn't have to explain the same things over and over again. And everybody knew what was expected of them and they knew um, that they would get our support as long as they followed the procedures. So that's a big reason for burnout is that property managers don't have sufficient support from their managers or their business owners who actually know what they're doing. Yeah. You mentioned a little while ago, you sort of made a bit of a joke about not another training session because you're known for running training sessions. Just to give people listening an idea, how often would you do training and things like that with your team? So kind of have little micro meetings because there's different sections. So you have your leasing section, you have your BDM team. And even if it's a small office, you have a BDM or you have a leasing person, you have a property management team. So I have a little meeting every Monday with my BDMs, make sure they're on track. Tuesday mornings, we have our leasing meetings. So we don't waste everyone's time with what's going on in leasing. We just do the leasing team. We look through the list, see what's vacant, see what we can do about pricing. And that actually becomes a coaching session. So I've got the leasing consultants, both of them, one on Zoom. We have the marketing person who lists the properties and my team leader, or my PM division manager, Caroline, and we all sit in there and the apps. So we have a admin team that just processes applications. So that's called our leasing team. And we all sit together and we brainstorm about what we can do to tenant a property. Maybe we change the photos. Like it's real-time stuff that we can do to limit vacancy times. 
And so that becomes a training session because then um, we might give some insight as to how to speak to an owner about reducing the price because that's a tough conversation sometimes. So that becomes a training session. And then on a Friday, we have our big team meetings every Friday and the phones get switched off. It's a proper meeting where we go through anything that's happened during the week. And we might do a little session with everyone on some particular piece of legislation. And then we might have the property managers just stay behind to go through something even more technical about lease renewals or lease breaks or what happens with DFV victims, et cetera. So each meeting becomes a little micro training session because there's a lot to learn. Nobody knows everything. And there's so much to learn. And I'm constantly listening to webinars And so I might pick something up, write it down. I think, oh, I'm going to do a training session on that. Then we might discuss that and perhaps some policy or procedure might change. We'll fix up a checklist and make sure it's all up to date. So it's a constant training, if you will. Yeah. Some of the people listening in might be thinking, um, that's great, but I find it really difficult to get my people to meetings in the first place. Do you have any tips on running a good meeting so that people actually want to come and join in? Okay, well, they're not negotiable. (laughs) Radio, yeah. Well, you've got to make it fun, you know. Uh, Everyone knows, this is the thing, everyone knows between 10 and 11, that's it. Don't make appointments unless there's an owner coming in from interstate and that's the only time they can make it. Well, obviously, there's exceptions. And we start off with good news or things that we're grateful for. We do some... uh, have friendly competition with arrears for example so we see who's arrears we have six property managers and who wins the you know lowest arrears rate this week we also have a competition on who's got the the least number of 2022 smoke alarm compliance to do because in Queensland it's all changing next year so we have little friendly competition between the PMs we look at our vacancy rate and so it, it, we move through fast I don't think they're boring meetings then we hear from the our little sales team in the corner <laughs> our two sales people and they tell us what's going on there and then I hand out congratulations for people who get good Google reviews for example and I think with the training too I think the team comes away with a feeling that they're actually learning and they're not just stagnating in a job. Again, I suppose with your REIQ hat on, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges the industry will face in the coming years? I mean, we've just been through a bit of a tough one, but what are some of the things that we should look out for in the next couple of years? Look, it's the old, the usual, other operators coming in, offering cheap fees, more of that, but more so now because of the technology that has really advanced, especially during COVID, that a lot of owners are thinking, well, I can just do this myself. I'll just pay for this software and I can do this. So that's always been there and I don't think that'll ever go away. But, you know, what brings about that conversation of cheap fees is that owners don't see the value in what we do. And that's really frustrating for everyone because there's a lot of things that we do behind the scenes. They really don't, even if you explained it to them, they they don't have a full appreciation. And I think that why they perceive that they're not getting value for money is again maybe back to the lack of training that a lot of property managers have and like this is not on property managers this is on us as the business owners this is fully on us because they don't the property managers don't know what they don't know but as business owners we have the responsibility to make sure that our team has the best possible training and knows what they're getting in for. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of agencies, that just doesn't happen. With lack of training comes ignorance and then mistakes get made. And so a property manager might mistakenly give the wrong advice to an owner about a tenant. And then unfortunately, it causes a big problem. It might go to QCAT, to tribunal. And tribunal will say, that's all wrong. You shouldn't have done that. That form's not right. You didn't fill that form incorrectly. It gets thrown out. And guess what? The poor property manager, it's all on her or him now because he's or she's made the mistake. And next thing you know, they've left, haven't they? Because why is this my fault? I didn't know. I didn't know. So lack of training. And then, of course, then the consumer sits there and goes, well, Why am I paying a property manager to do something when they don't even know what they're doing? And so that's that lack of perceived value that they're getting. And I think lack of training is a big part of that. 
And so that then leads to consumer perception. So the consumer believes that we're all pretty hopeless and we're all the same. So why not just go for the cheapest one and be done with it? And we all know that the difference between fees, between expensive and cheap, is just so minimal. But the difference between a good property manager and a bad one or a good managing agency and a bad one is huge and could cost the owner thousands of dollars. And unfortunately, they don't know that until they experience it themselves. That's an interesting one, actually. So for anyone listening to this, how would you articulate that to an owner? Let's just say I've I've got an investment property and I've brought it to you and I've said, just how much do you charge? What's the fee? Well, before I answer that, I'm going to tell you what we do. So, you know, this is what everyone does. A good BDM will say this. They'll say, well, before I tell you our fees, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do for you. And salespeople, they're experts at doing this. This is what we do. We do inspections so many times a year. We report back with photos. We uh, ensure your, the lease is renewed without it going into a periodic agreement so it ensures your secure tenancy. We professionally advertise. We do this. We there's any issues with the tenants, we take care of it. Any neighbourhood disputes, we take care of it. Maintenance, we take care of maintenance. We inform you every step of the way. We use these kind of software programs to keep communication open with you. We collect the rent. We give you your statements. We do all your accounting for you. We pay this. We, we pay your rates, your water. We invoice tenants for their water and we chase those up. We take care of main, of your rent statements, I said, and rent arrears. All those things that we do that owners really don't understand. But more important, like this is what we all do. But then when we talk about our value statement and, and everyone has every agency has something different. What we talk about in our office is that we have very experienced, fully trained property managers. We don't outsource. Do you know what I mean? We don't outsource to people who do routine inspections for us. We have your property manager go out and do those inspections and owners like that. So they believe, oh, okay, I'm prepared to pay for that because we give them that value. We tell them about our processes that mean that their exposure to risk is minimised by taking care of maintenance straight away without delay, by making sure leases are renewed in time. And, and all of that actually just comes down to processes. It sounds really boring, but seriously, it all comes down to proper processes. If you have proper processes and procedures in place and you train your staff in following the processes, and then everything works out and, and mistakes happen, but they are very minimal. So in trying to explain all that to clients, I still don't think I've got it because if I knew, then we would have a much bigger business than we do and we wouldn't lose any managements due to mistakes that happen that we have no control over. So that's the hardest thing is to explain your value proposition where the consumer will understand and also believe you because unfortunately there is a history of real estate agents just not being believed, unfortunately. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I know a lot of real estate agents, obviously, and some of them are some of the hardest workers I know in any profession. And it's amazing that, that the public don't see it that way often enough. There's theories behind this and you can speak to experts in this area. One line of thought is that because there are so many bad operators, now when I say so many, I don't mean a huge percentage. I just mean if you have a 1,000 agents, you might have 10 that are, are really bad and they make a really bad name for everyone else. And so then the public sees that and they perceive that's pervasive amongst all of real estate agents and unless they've had a good experience with an agent then they think that we're all the same and unfortunately we haven't done a very good job yet of showing that value proposition to our customers who would be prepared to pay the right fees for the kind of service that they receive. I do hope that some of the work that you're doing definitely gets noticed because it is you know definitely I think good for the real estate industry and, and this is why you've been recognised in this way and a real feather in your cap and I hope everyone recognises how good this is for the industry that you're going out there and doing this stuff. 
So, Laura, it's been amazing catching up with you today after all this time. (laughs) And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today and a bit about what you're doing and and obviously for the work that you do. If there was one thought that you'd like to leave people with today, what would it be? I had something prepared because I can't keep it to one thought. I've got three, if that's okay. So number one, embrace change. Like I know you've heard it. Everyone's heard it last year, but it didn't start last year with COVID. It's been going on for years and years, and every year you have to stay up with the change, otherwise you're going to be left behind. So don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. The second thing I would say is just be passionate about what you do and and just give it your best shot. So I heard someone say, even if you're a janitor cleaning toilets, like just do the best you possibly can, have the cleanest toilets in, in, in the whole area and just be passionate about what you do and that will come through to your clients, to everyone that you deal with. And lastly, I would say, say yes to opportunities. So if something's presented to you and you feel uncomfortable about it and you feel it's totally out of your comfort zone, then you absolutely should give it a go because if I didn't say yes to an opportunity that came to me five or six years ago and I didn't stretch out of my comfort zone to actually go forward and do it, then I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you and have this amazing award behind me. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I couldn't agree with you more. And it's good advice for women as well as men. Yes, back yourself. This is what somebody told me, Laura, back yourself, back yourself, because who else is going to do it if you don't? (laughs) Absolutely. And keep saying yes. Laura Valenti, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Elevate with thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts. Visit eliteagentelevate.com.